All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I'm Dr. Karen Anderson, and I want to welcome all of you here today. As you can see from my title slide, we're going to be talking about strategies to manage depression. So if that's not your intent, uh, you probably want to find a different talk to go to. Um, so I'll give you a bit of an overview of our talk. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a neuropsychiatrist, and I'm the director of the Huntington's Disease Center for Care Education and Research at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. We also have satellite facilities in McLean, Virginia, and in Olney, Maryland. Thank you again to HDSA for inviting me to speak. Um, they do want me to remind you that this is a workshop to share information, but it's not to give personal medical advice and that no one should take um, information from this workshop as their sole source of medical advice. You should really discuss this with your own care team and your own uh, clinicians. A couple of disclosures. I am a consultant to uh, Lundbeck Pharmaceuticals. I'm also a consultant to Teva Pharmaceuticals. I've been um, a site investigator for several of their clinical trials, um, including for SD-809, um, and have been on scientific advisory panels for both Lundbeck and Teva. So I'll give you an, an overview of my talk, just so you know how this workshop is going to be structured. I'm going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes to give you some background on depression in Huntington's disease, a little bit about how to recognize it, what to think about if you or a loved one think you may have depression, a little bit on treatment strategies, um, and then we're going to uh, have a panel discussion with some lovely ladies um, who have agreed to come up and talk about their personal experiences with depression and Huntington's disease. That'll be another 20 minutes or so. And then we'll leave a good 20 or 30 minutes at the end for more questions. So I'll do some Q&A with the panel, and then we'll have an open session for questions from the audience. But certainly during our panel discussion, if particular questions or issues come to mind, please raise your hand and let me know. If any of you have trouble hearing me or any of the speakers at any time, please let us know. We've had a little trouble with the microphone in this room today. So for my portion of the talk, I'm going to start out by discussing the symptoms of depression because it's more than just sadness. As you'll see, there are many things that go into myself as a psychiatrist thinking about depression and how to diagnose it and whether to treat it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about depression versus apathy. So apathy is problems with motivation. How do you tell if someone is truly depressed or if they're really just having more trouble with motivation, which is a, a separate issue on its own? I'll talk a little bit about non-pharmacological therapy, so non-drug treatments that we have available for depression, things you can do at home, things where you might consult a professional counselor. Then I'll talk about medication treatments for depression to give you an idea of how I think about these treatments as a psychiatrist. And then I'll mention a little note on suicide also because it's such an important and crucial topic. I want to make sure you have a little bit of information on that too. So as many of you know, I'm sure, depression goes across all the stages of HD. And it can even occur before someone has what we call a motor or a movement diagnosis. So before someone has a formal clinical diagnosis of Huntington's disease, it's not unusual to see the person have symptoms of depression and other psychiatric uh, symptoms. The tricky thing is that if you're from an HD family and you have symptoms of depression, you may be concerned that it's the first signs of HD. And I always tell people, this is not a reason to delay getting care or treatment. It doesn't mean you're going to get diagnosed with HD. It just means you have depression. And indeed, if you look out in the general population outside of Huntington's disease, there are a lot of people with depression. So it's really important to recognize if you're someone who's at risk for HD, you think you have depression, you're struggling with it, or someone who's tested gene positive but doesn't have a clinical diagnosis of HD, Getting treatment does not mean you're going to get diagnosed with HD. It means you're going to get your depression treated and you're going to feel better and do better and enjoy the quality time that you have. So a really important message that I always get across to people in our testing program who are thinking about getting genetic testing or anyone from an HD family who's at risk. 
Another thing about depression is that it can worsen as the condition progresses. So there's been some work showing that early on people develop some depression as they become aware of early symptoms of HD. Sometimes this seems to trigger more depression as they start to lose the ability to do things or to be told that they need to change the way they're doing things in response to HD. Um, it can go all the way through to the later stages of the disease when someone is physically very disabled. So there's really no point in HD where I could say, well, depression's not really an issue for you. Really across all the stages, we have to be vigilant for depression, we have to be concerned, and we have to think about it. As I'll say later in my talk, depression can be confused with apathy. So apathy is incredibly common in HD. About half the people with HD have trouble with motivation, have trouble getting started on things, following through on things, and sometimes it can look a lot like depression. So this is one of the issues where, as a psychiatrist, I can be very helpful in sort of teasing out for people whether it's truly depression, is it apathy, or is it maybe a combination of the two. So this is one of the few slides I have with some data, so just uh, be patient with me here. Um, I like this slide because it shows you that depression is so common in HD. So this is called a prevalence slide. And what it does is it takes several of the larger studies that we have. So each of these is a different study that's been done um, in Huntington's disease looking at depression and asking the question at this point in time, how many people in the study have depression? Across here is the percent of people that report depression. So there's some variability because people ask about depression in different ways. They may have different things you have to check off to get a diagnosis of depression. But the big message here is, you know, depending on how you ask, anywhere from 20 up to 80% of people with HD have depression at some point in the illness. So this doesn't mean that everyone's always depressed or that 80% of people always have depression. What it means is that it's very common. It's common across the different stages and that it's, again, important to really be vigilant for depression if your loved one has HD or if you yourself have it or are at risk. So one of the things that happens to people with HD and HD family is losses, and this can really contribute to depression. So certainly, as I said, loss of independence, loss of the ability to drive, loss of your home, or loss of loved ones. Perhaps you have other family members that are dying from the condition. This can really drive some of the depression or trigger some of the depression. Another topic I'll just touch on, it's important, but we don't have the, the time for this today, it's not the focus of this discussion, is caregiver depression. So we heard a wonderful presentation this morning from our introductory speaker on the burdens on a caregiver, the way they're pulled in many different directions, and the stresses placed on them. So as you could imagine, this is pretty much a perfect storm for depression. And it's not uncommon when I have a patient with HD who's brought into the office by their spouse or by their child who's taking care of them to realize that actually the care partner is as depressed or more depressed because of the stresses going on. And again, depression is very treatable, important to get in for treatment whether you're the care partner or the patient. When I'm looking at depression as a psychiatrist, it actually encompasses more than just sadness. So I think there's sort of a misconception out there that to be depressed, you sort of have to be crying all the time, you have to look very sad, and certainly that's part of it, but there are certainly other factors that I evaluate as a psychiatrist. So looking at appetite changes, certainly, if someone's expressing that it's not worth living, they, the common thing they'll say is, I, I don't wanna go on, I feel like I'm a burden to everyone, what's the point, why am I doing this? Very, very common to hear those sorts of things in depression. Poor concentration, so maybe someone who's able to work finds it's harder and harder to keep up at work. They're worried that maybe this is HD progressing when perhaps it's really some signs of depression. Perhaps the depressive thoughts they're having, the difficulty focus, focusing are really part of, of a mood disorder. So very important to think about this. Low energy, again, anytime you have a neurological disease, you may have a lot of fatigue, it may be very hard for you to get through the day. Everything you do takes longer and it's harder to do. But when you're depressed, it can also really sap your energy and sap your vitality. So that's another thing that people report very commonly with depression. And then sleep changes, either sleeping too much or too little, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail. So 
So depression always does not always look like sadness. As I said, people are kind of expected to be cheerful, sobbing, saying they're sad. It's not uncommon when someone's very depressed that they don't realize they're depressed. They don't understand how sad they are. Um, often when someone's depressed, they don't know how bad they are until they're better. It's not uncommon to see that. So one of the things that can happen when someone's depressed is they can really look more irritable. They may find that everything bothers them, that it's just hard to be around other people, and they really want to isolate themselves to avoid feeling irritated at everyone else. Some depressed people get very anxious. So one of the common things I see is the person who's depressed and sad, but they're also anxious. They kind of get things stuck in their head. They can't stop worrying about them. We call that rumination. So you, have, you sort of have the hamster wheel in your head of worry going on in the background of being very depressed and sad, and really the anxiety comes out more. Anger is another common thing that you see. The people who are depressed, they're irritable, and it starts to manifest outward, shouting, angry, difficult to help with things if they need help. And then sometimes it comes out as resentment, where they, they're, they're angry at the people who help them. They're angry at their spouse. They're angry if they have paid helpers, because those people get to go home at the end of the day, and they still have HD, and it's not fair. So that's another thing that I really look for, is someone you know, really is there really a big personality change, and they really become much more angry and resentful and difficult than they had been in the past. So what's the impact of depression? Well, they've looked at different neurological diseases. And one of the things they found across neurological diseases, not just HD, is that people who are depressed, not surprisingly, don't do as well. If you have depression on top of a neurological disease, you're not going to do as well with that neurological disease. So in general, what we see in people who have depression is a faster progression. Their, their symptoms of disease seem to go faster. They have more trouble with memory. So again, you have depression that's impacting your ability to organize your thoughts and do what you need to do. So you're not going to do as well with memory. A lower quality of life. You can't enjoy the things that you're able to do. Certainly an increased burden on the family because you're taking some care of someone with physical problems, but now it's compounded by the depression, by the difficulties that they have just navigating things in daily life. Harder to take care of yourself. If you're depressed, it's often very hard to get out of bed and shower and do the basic things that you need to do for yourself. And then a very negative focus, so a feeling that everything in life is bad. Even the things I'm able to do are not good. They're not worth doing. So for those of you who can't read my cartoon here, it says, you can wrap it up in a pretty package, but it's still life. And that sort of sums up what, what depression can be like for some people. So as a psychiatrist, when someone comes in to see me with this question, you know, am I, am I depressed? Their family wants to know, are they depressed? What are the things that I look at? So certainly low mood. I always ask, you know, are you sad? Do you find that you feel sad much of the time, that you feel like you're down, like you're blue? Those are some of the, the terms that I tend to use when I'm speaking with someone. Feelings of guilt. So do you find that you're, you're very focused on things you may have done wrong, things where you feel like you've failed other people? Are they tearful? That's certainly a, a very obvious one. Do they express hopelessness? This is a very big one. So is it someone who, again, says, What's the point? Why am I going on? Why am I here? I'm not, I'm not worth anything. I'm not good. And that's a, a sort of common thing that you'll hear from people who are very depressed. I mentioned irritability, so becoming very hard to get along with, very focused on negative things. And then a loss of interest in activities, so something that someone liked to do a couple months ago, something they're able to do, and they really don't enjoy it. They don't seek it out. And a loss of enjoyment. So even something like the kids visiting or grandkids visiting, they just find they can't even enjoy that and they want to they isolate from that. Those are all pretty good signs that someone could have depression. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, appetite and sleep change in depression for many people. So uh, it can go either way. We probably all know people who eat too much. You know, when they're depressed, the Ben and Jerry's is, is all over the house and they're eating way too much and other people who just completely lose their appetite when they're depressed. So it really varies quite a bit. And sleep is very much the same. So some people, when they're depressed, as part of their isolation, they sleep too much. They're in their room with the shades drawn all day. They say they're resting. They, they want to be away from things. Other people are 
agitated, anxious, and they can't sleep. That's part of the depression. They just feel like they can't get comfortable, they can't sleep, they can't get any rest. And then the question about personality change. So is this a big turnaround? Is this someone who's always been a little less social, a little more introverted? Or is this a big change where somebody was very bubbly and interactive and now they really want to be on their own? So a couple of other factors that I think about when I'm evaluating someone for depression. So a lot of people with HD have sleep problems. You all know this, right? So people's sleep can get really flipped around where they stay up most of the night and they sleep during the day. Um, they can have what's called sleep fragmentation where they fall asleep for a bit but they never get really sound sleep. So you may sleep for 10 hours but it's not good quality sleep because you're kind of up and down, in and out of sleep. This can certainly contribute to a low mood, being more fatigued, being uh, you know, less cognitively aware. And certainly if you have a little bit of depression, this can make it much worse. So this is one of the things I always look at is, is there an underlying sleep disorder making this worse? Another, another one certainly, as I talked about before, is a loss. So HD tends to, tends to put a lot of losses on people. So you know, one of the things that we do, for those of you who've been to clinic know, is we often tell people no. We tell them, no, you're no longer able to drive. You're no longer able to take care of your kids on your own. You're no longer able to work. This is, this is a hard thing. And I think as clinicians, it's, it's really incumbent on us to recognize that we're giving people these, these big things. It's, uh, it's necessary in the case of driving for safety. It's incredibly important. But we are telling people that a big chunk of what they're used to doing is going to have to stop. And we really have to help patients and families deal with this. And this is one of the things that can really trigger depression um, when someone's told that they really can't do these things that they may view as, as really part of their identity. A death of an affected family member uh, is another very big one, particularly an anniversary reaction, as we call it in psychiatry. So I have one patient whose father shot himself at a certain time of year. And we always know when that time of year comes, it's going to be very rough because of the, the sense of, you know, this is what happened to my dad. He had HD. I have it too. Is this what's going to happen to me? So very, very important to be aware of these anniversary reactions. And then this is one that, that's coming up more and more. You know, so we're incredibly blessed right now in the HD field to have all these clinical trials going on. It's, it's more than I could ever have imagined when I first started working in HD. So people are going into clinical trials. They're doing something. They're being part of something. And then the trial ends. And the treatment team says, goodbye. You're done with your clinical trial now. We're done with you. And uh, it can really make people feel like there's a big gap, and they're not sure what to do with that. They felt like they've been proactive, they're part of something, then they never find a result. They may not find out what treatment they were on. They don't know if they've made a difference. So I think it's really important in the, the centers that are doing clinical trials that we be aware of this and that we stay in touch with people after trials end, make sure they're doing OK, and make sure they understand how much they've contributed during the trials. So now a word on depression versus apathy. So apathy, again, is a problem with motivation. We all have this to some degree, right? The days when it's really hard to get up and do something, maybe it's raining and it's cold and you just don't want to get out of bed and do anything. Apathy is really that more of the time. When you feel like it's very hard to get started on things, you may not be interested in getting started. It's just very hard to do things. And it kind of goes across the spectrum. So it can be apathy for things that you used to like to do but you don't care about. So I used to go fishing, but now it's just too much trouble. I feel like I wouldn't enjoy it. I don't enjoy it once I get out there. It's too much trouble to get up in the morning, too much trouble to put on my clothes. So you know, one question I often ask about apathy is, if your family went out of town and you were on your own for a couple days, would you still get up? Would you get dressed? Would you make yourself some kind of a meal, even if it's a peanut butter sandwich? Or would you really just stay in bed in your pajamas all weekend and maybe eat some cold cereal? You know, that's, that's sort of the line of apathy for me. So, so is it depression, or is it apathy, or is it a mix of both? So to me, having sad mood, again, if, if someone really identifies that they're sad, they feel like they've, they're hopeless, they're losing things, that to me puts it more clearly in the camp of depression. If they've lost interest in things, that's a harder one, because sometimes they just feel like they won't enjoy it because they're depressed. 
So, you know, once you start an activity, would you feel like you'd enjoy it? Maybe once I get into it, I think, oh, this is actually nice. I like it. Or is it really, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it because I don't care, which is more apathy. So differentiating between the two, sometimes we consider a trial of an antidepressant even if we're not completely sure. And I'll have that discussion with families. I'll say, I think it might be some depression. Maybe it's also some apathy. I want to try an antidepressant for a few weeks and just see, does this make a difference or not? The one thing to keep in mind here is that some of the antidepressants, particularly the SSRI antidepressants, can actually make apathy worse. So one discussion we have sometimes is if someone's been treated for depression for a very long time and they've been doing well, but it seems like now they're just not so interested, they seem more apathetic, maybe it's time to reduce the dose of the antidepressant a little bit and maybe even try to taper off it because maybe it's actually making things worse. So a little point to keep in mind there. Now a special note on this medicine, tetrabenazine. So how many in the, of you in the room are familiar with tetrabenazine or at least heard about it? So it's a medicine that's used to treat chorea, the fast movements in Huntington's disease, and it's very effective in ramping down chorea. The difficulty we run into in psychiatry is that it interferes with dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine in the brain. It knocks down those chemicals. And those are some of the chemicals that help us to be interested in things and have a good mood and be engaged in life. So it can cause depression. So I want you all to, to know this because if you have a loved one or if you yourself are taking tetrabenazine for chorea and you find that you're getting depressed, one of the conversations to have with your doctors is, is it time to think about reducing the tetrabenazine a little bit? Is the tetrabenazine making me a little depressed? And certainly if you're on tetrabenazine and you develop any suicidal thoughts, you really need to have the dosage reduced. Another important point is that the depression with tetrabenazine could be delayed. So it may be that you've been on the drug for a few months uh, and then you develop depression. You still want to try reducing the tetrabenazine if you can. As a side note, there is a drug, um, SD809, which will be called Asteto, that is coming out from Teva. Uh, we hope to have approval from the FDA and that may help to uh, mitigate some of the depressive symptoms. So hopefully those will be reduced with this new drug. Uh, but, uh, but an important point to keep in mind when you're getting your movement symptoms treated. So now I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about non-pharmacological therapies, meaning non-drug therapies. Uh, you know, I think we get very focused on medications and drugs and we have these great antidepressants that work very well for many people, but really there are some people that don't do so well with antidepressants. Some people have a lot of side effects. Some people are already taking five pills for sleep and anxiety and their movements and they don't want to take another pill on top of that. Not everyone is going to respond to an antidepressant, so there are some people, again, where the side effects are so limiting. Um, and, you know, it may be that people want to have some counseling, want to have some talk therapy or other strategies to try either before trying an antidepressant or in conjunction to see if they can move things along a little faster. So the first one, uh, something you can certainly do in your own home, if someone seems depressed, think about increasing their activities and about more structure. So one of the things I often advise people is if someone's not working, if they're at home, especially by themselves during the day for chunks of time, are there neighbors, are there friends who could schedule lunch dates with them during the week just to get out for an hour or two, just so they know that every day someone's going to show up and take them for coffee or for lunch or for a walk, and just having that kind of structure can be very helpful. When someone's depressed, it can be very hard for them to manage that. It can be really hard for them to pick up the phone and call someone and say, come have lunch with me. So it's, uh, it's helpful to have others kind of impose a schedule on them to try to get them doing more. Exercise. So whatever exercise you're able to do, um, it's certainly very helpful for mental health in general. I think it's, it's helpful for people with HD. So if it's walking with someone else so that you don't fall, if it's doing seated exercises with a videotape in the chair and hand weights, whatever you're able to do, it's often really helpful in, in alleviating some of the depression. Certainly hobbies that you're able to do. So I mentioned fishing as an example. Maybe it's not realistic for you to get in a canoe and go out and fish by yourself. But if someone had a platform and you could sit on the platform and you had someone with you, could you still go out and fish a bit? And maybe that would make you feel a little better. 
So, so trying, to, trying to reframe some of these hobbies in ways that you're able to do them, even if you, uh, you feel like you've lost them, can you reclaim some of them? Outdoor time. So it's, it's always amazing to me the number of people who say you know, they don't go out unless they're going to the doctor's office because it can be hard to get out or the climate doesn't cooperate. But um, in terms of, of daylight exposure, I mean, that is a very important thing to sort of reset your clock to let your brain know that it's daytime and you should be awake and you should be active. And uh, again, it probably does help with mood. So even just getting out on the patio or at least sitting in a sunny room for a few minutes, really helpful in terms of mood. And then uh, supportive talk therapy. So finding a counselor, doesn't have to be an expert in Huntington's disease, but someone that you like to talk to, somebody who seems sympathetic, that you like to spend time with, who's not your family, so that you feel like you have someone your own who, who does not have an agenda of their own that you can talk with. Really helpful. So I'm going to mention a couple of particular kinds of therapy. These are not the only talk therapies out there, but these are a couple of the specialized ones that I think are helpful. So the first one is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And the idea behind this is that thoughts and feelings cause behaviors, not external things. So it's not the people around me that are making me depressed, it's my thoughts and my reactions to that. So you catch and you label and reevaluate negative feelings. So when I have a negative feeling about something, so you know, I feel like it's terrible because I have to live in this house and it's got two stories and I'm gonna fall down the stairs. I catch that feeling. I tell myself, I'm really careful on the stairs. I haven't fallen, and my family's around. And if I fall, I'll get help very quickly. So catching these feelings that are limiting you and keeping you down and really uh, you know, figuring out a solution to them. A lot of it involves very practical things like writing down lists of problems and then writing down solutions, figuring out what's the solution, what's the antidote to the, the bad thought that's holding you down. Uh, many of the common targets for, for cognitive behavioral therapy and medical illness are being dependent on other people, being a burden, and being isolated. And it can be also very helpful as someone's uh, care partner. It can be very helpful to do this kind of therapy because it's usually time limited, so it's a few weeks of therapy, not months and years. And again, it's very practical and very real life goal oriented. Another thing that's gotten very popular, you've probably seen articles on this in magazines, is called mindfulness. So the idea of mindfulness is really to reduce physical and emotional stress and make day-to-day -day life better. Sounds great, right? So, so what it involves is really paying attention to your surroundings and being present in your surroundings rather than reacting to them right away. So really trying to take a step back and think about where you are in the moment and what's going on around you. So being aware of experiences, not getting consumed by experiences, and then making choices yourself so that you feel like you're more in control, even when you can't be completely in control. So for example, you have a family Thanksgiving that you know is going to be stressful. You know there might be arguing. You know it could be unpleasant. But you've chosen to go. So if you've chosen to go, how are you going to experience it in the best way possible and not react to it in ways that maybe weren't so helpful in the past? So now I'll just talk for a couple of minutes about different treatments, different medication treatments that we use for depression. So as I'll show you, the way I think about these is mostly in terms of potential side effects. So if you come to me to ask what antidepressant is the best for me to take, I'll probably think about the side effects of the antidepressants um, as one of the first, uh, first choices that I make. Really important, response is, never, is always steady, never steady or immediate. So someone could get a bit better and then it may take a bit longer and it will take some time. It's never take a pill and feel better the next day. So these are some different antidepressants. They're certainly not all the antidepressants in the world. And as I said, it's based on, on side effects. So I can't recommend any particular one for any one person, but I can tell you how I think about them so you get an idea if you go to see a psychiatrist, this may be how they're thinking about treating you. So probably the most common category that we use, SSRIs, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And the way that I usually think about these are, are the ones that are more activating, like um, sertraline. So if somebody's, somebody needs to be perked up a little bit, I'll choose sertraline, versus the ones that are a little more sedating. If someone's kind of anxious and worked up and they need to be calmer, 
I might choose one like paroxetine, fluoxetine, or citalopram. These are all in my slide handouts, so if you want to look up the brand names later or ask me about the brand names, you can do that. Um, there is a newer one called Velazidone, which is an SSRI, and then also a serotonin partial agonist, uh, which is supposed to have reduced sexual side effects. So as I said, you know, one of the things we always think about is what side effect might this cause? If you're someone who's very concerned about sexual side effects or if you've experienced these in the past with other medications, you may want to think about a newer drug like Velazidone. So then there's another class of medication called the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, or SNRIs, which are great antidepressants. They're great for anxiety, but they do tend to have a little more cognitive effects early on, meaning they can make people a little tired. They might make them feel a little bit slowed down early on. If someone gets through the initial treatment with these, they often do very well. But for someone who's already a little cognitively impaired or who's very concerned about uh, what effects this might have on their thinking, it might not be the place to start. Um, bupropion is another antidepressant that is more activating. So if someone's very tired and slowed down, having a hard time getting out, it can be a great choice for them. But if someone's more anxious and irritable, it might really ramp that up. So thinking about, you know, what's, what's the best balance of side effects. Mirtazapine is a very old antidepressant. Um, which has noradrenergic and serotonergic activity, it can be very sedating. So if you're someone who's depressed and you get anxious at night and you can't sleep, it can be a great choice. It's also very good for weight gain. So if you're someone who has trouble eating and swallowing and some trouble sleeping, maybe it's a great choice for you. But if you're someone who's already sleeping too much and you've weighed too much, it may not be the right choice. Tricyclics, again, older antidepressants can work very well for some people, but they do tend to have more cognitive effects, meaning they make people feel slowed down sometimes or a little bit sedated, and uh, also they can cause weight gain. So that sort of takes you through some of the big categories. Like I said, it's not all antidepressants that are available. One other thing I just want to mention is called, called augmenting. So sometimes when someone's on an antidepressant, it's worked well, but it hasn't worked completely, or it's worked for a while, and then it's kind of stopped working. Rather than going up on a higher dose, which might just give someone side effects, sometimes what we'll do in psychiatry is add something from another class. So if you're on one of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, maybe I'll add something from a different class of medication to try to get sort of a nice combination of treatment for you. Or maybe I'll add what's called a mood stabilizer. So maybe your depression is treated, but you're still having some ups and downs. Maybe I'll try to smooth that out with a mood stabilizer. I mention that because sometimes we're taught that, you know, if you're on two medicines for the same thing, it's not good, it's not the right thing. But there are cases in psychiatry where augmenting, you actually do end up putting two antidepressants together or adding another psychiatric medication. So some really important treatment notes about antidepressants. As I said, it's not take a pill and get better the next day. It's take a pill on faith for four to six weeks and then start to get better. So that's, that's often very hard. People don't, don't want to take things for a month or more before they feel much of a positive effect. So it's important to, to support people if someone's taking an antidepressant to encourage them to keep taking it until they feel better. They have to be taken regularly, so if you start taking it, you should try to take it every single day if possible. Um, really important, so when you start to feel better from depression, you should keep taking the medicine for nine months or even up to a year. If you stop too early, even if you're feeling completely better, you could have what's called a relapse. The depression could come back, and it might be even harder to treat the second time. So if you're doing well, really important to take the antidepressants for a few more months. And then in some cases, if someone's had several bad episodes of depression, if they've tried to harm themselves, I may recommend that they stay on their antidepressant long term. I don't like to have people on medication for a long time, but sometimes it really is the better option to keep someone stable and to avoid relapsing into a really severe, really bad episode. So I'm just going to give a couple notes on suicide now. So as we all know, suicide is a very um, important topic in Huntington's because people are at higher risk of taking their own lives. So a really conservative estimate is probably four times increased from the general population of people taking their own lives if they have HD. So another issue, of course, is that because suicide is more common, 
people from HD may have a family member who have committed suicide, and they may, may view it more as an option for themselves. You know, my parent killed themselves, so maybe it's the thing I should do. I don't want to get sick like they did. Maybe, it's, maybe that's why they did it, and it's the right thing for me. So the important takeaway from this is that asking about suicidal thoughts does not cause someone to attempt suicide. You're not going to put the idea in their head by asking them. What you're going to do is find out important information that you can take back to their care team. So don't ever hesitate to ask someone if they're thinking about harming themselves. So in HD, all the usual factors as far as risk of suicide are really important. So being depressed, certainly having another psychiatric condition, not having children, being single, substance abuse, of course, and owning weapons. But there are also some very impulsive suicide attempts that happen in HD because of the changes in the brain that cause us to have trouble putting the brakes on the brain. So what do we do about this? Well, the, the thing I advise my families in my center is called means reduction. So what is this? It's making things harder for someone to hurt themselves, taking away the really easy, obvious ways to hurt yourself so someone has to slow down and think for a minute or two before they harm themselves. So just separating guns and bullets. So I, I know a lot of people like to hunt. They have guns that they've collected over the years. OK, if you want to keep the guns, then lock the bullets up in the gun safe or vice versa so that you have to actually go and load the gun and think about it a little bit before you harm yourself as opposed to keeping a loaded gun around, which is a terrible idea for many reasons. If someone's taking a lot of medication and they could potentially do a lethal overdose, have family members keep track of the medication and maybe only hand out the dose for the day so that they can't stockpile it and harm themselves. One of my favorite examples, again, not, not from Huntington's, but from the general population of means reduction, the Golden Gate Bridge. So when they built the Golden Gate Bridge, originally they had two sides with barriers. One side had a barrier that you could sort of step over without much effort at all. The other side had a barrier that wasn't even waist high. You didn't have to be an acrobat to get over it. It just took a little bit of effort. When they looked at suicide attempts, they actually looked at which side people jumped off. Of course, everyone jumped off the easier side because all you had to do was just step over. You didn't have to boost yourself over. So when they raised the barrier, of course, the suicide attempts on the bridge went down. But a very good example, if you just make people think a minute, if someone has to just get up on the barrier and think for a minute before they push over, you may save a life versus a person who can just step over and do it quickly. So I'm just going to end with a couple words on team-based care for depression. So um, you know, at, uh, at Georgetown, at our center, this is really what we practice. So everyone in our center is very involved in care of, of depression. I'm very fortunate to have Dr. Tom Cummings as another neuropsychiatrist in the center with me. But certainly the neurologists, the social workers, even the physical and occupational therapists, everyone is very aware of depression and looks for it. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Because maybe the physical therapist who spends more sessions with you is more likely to recognize your depression than I am seeing you once or twice in the office every couple months, right? So just to give you a sense um, of the many clinicians we have, we have several neurologists. We have myself, there's Dr. Cummings, a psychiatrist. We have genetic counseling. We have, we have a wonderful team of social workers. So really a team-based approach and making sure that the members of the team are communicating. So if a physical therapist picks up on something and thinks there's depression, they communicate it to the rest of the team. So I want to end by thanking all of you for coming today. I really want to thank HDSA for recognizing how important depression is and providing an opportunity for us to talk about it a bit. Here's our team at one of the wonderful HDSA Walks for Hope. And you've crossed the finish line of my talk now. So now I'd like to uh, invite our panelists to come up, the stars of the show. audio rearrange here. All right, would you ladies like to come up? I'd like to introduce our panel members now. First, we have Doris Nguanti, we have Ann Selden, and we have Carrie Barnett. So I'm going to ask them a few questions. 
and, uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Let us know if you are not able to hear us. All right. So, so I wonder if any of you could comment on what it's like when someone you love is depressed. How can you tell when they're depressed? Um, it was kind of hard for me at first because I never thought of my husband as the type of person who would get depression and he had to actually tell me <laughs> before it really sunk in and it almost got to the critical point. Now uh, that I've gone through that with him, it's a little bit easier to tell. He's, um, like she mentioned earlier, he doesn't want to always get out of bed, especially if I'm not home, if I'm at work, he'll just stay in bed until he has to get up. Fortunately, he's a fan of Dr. Phil, <laughs> so he gets up to watch that every day. So he gets up and showers, and he'll be watching Dr. Phil when I get home. But if I'm not there to get him out of the house, um, sometimes he'll just stay in bed all afternoon. Any other comments? Well, I can relate to that. I, I'm a, actually a person with HD myself, and uh, I know it's like when I am married, and my husband works up until recently, he just retired, but so when he's at work, I tend to be much less motivated to get organized in terms of getting dressed and getting up and that kind of thing, if he happens to be at work too. So I tend to be that way myself. It's just a lack of motivation and initiative kind of keeps me from doing that myself. Uh -huh. Something that Carrie and I discussed about what depression looks like, you know, and, and how to tell if somebody close to us is depressed. She mentioned that um, her husband doesn't talk as much. They are more withdrawn and less uh, voluble. Um, and I know that when I'm depressed, I don't feel the kind of energy. Uh, usually, I'm a pretty sunny side up type of person. Mm -hmm. And um, when I find myself not feeling the energy to do things I like, that really is an indication for me. So low energy, withdrawing from activities, and then not being motivated to do things that you really should do, like at least getting up out of bed. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about some of the strategies I talked about that aren't medication? Have any of you tried those with your family members? Do you feel like it works to do some of these interventions, or do you feel like medication is, is really more the option? Well, I find that having an activity to do cheers carry up no end. It's mm -hmm. really, uh, it makes a big difference when she's got something to look forward to that's happening that day. Um, structured schedule hasn't been all that much a part of our uh -huh. therapy, but it might be in the future. Uh -huh. Um, a walking together really does seem to mm -hmm. make both of us feel better. Okay. So those are activities that uh -huh. we like to do together. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with that. You know, when they, when my husband has too much time to sit at home and just think, it makes everything worse. If I'm home and I can get him out of the house, go get a cup of coffee, or you know, just go for a ride, it helps tremendously. What do you do if someone if, if someone has to work and they can't get a ride to go places? What do you do in that situation? Because that's where the structured activities often fall apart, right? Right, yeah. I mean, and that's where I struggle, for sure. Mm -hmm. So I don't have an answer for that one. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sort of that way, kind of stuck at home mm -hmm. until, mm -hmm. you know, for most of the better part of the day until my husband gets right. home from work so I'm you know left by myself at home to you know and I don't drive anymore so pretty much you know have to follow activities at home like watching TV and that kind of thing and eating sort of making snacks for myself oh, wow. at the moment. Can you speak up just a little bit? Sure. 
sorry. I'm kind of stuck at home by myself during the day because my husband is work at work, so he gets home kind of later in the day. So I do have trouble, you know, getting organized to get out of bed and, you know, do stuff without him there. Anyway, I do feel like I'm stuck. My sister, who lives in Turkey, um, also has Huntington's disease, and um, she has a huge network of family and friends. She taught English in a private school for many years, and a lot of her former students visit her. She has friends in the staff. Even though she's retired, she sees a lot of people she used to work with. They have lunch together. She has a huge family of loving Turkish relatives, and um, she has been able to overcome depression very successfully, but it took a lot of other people and support. So I think that's something, I mean, I feel like we need to reach out and, you know, engage other people that know Carrie from work, or know her from uh, other activities that she's performed in the past. She's volunteered at for animal hospitals and things like that. So those kind of connections would be nice if she had lunch with someone from them, the former occupations. And I think it's it's helpful to be really specific when you reach out to people. So you know, not can you help me with my sister, right? But yeah. do you think maybe once a once a month? you'd be willing to come by and just have a cup of coffee. You know, something kind of small to start with and very specific. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of it. Otherwise, I think people may feel overwhelmed or they're just not sure what they want you to do. And they don't know where to start. They don't know where to start. Yeah. yeah. So what about an antidepressant? So if someone is taking an antidepressant medicine, what's your experience like for knowing if it's working or not? How, how does it look when someone gets better from depression? Why don't we start with that? Well, my husband is definitely talks more. He'll start a conversation as opposed to me trying to keep the conversation going. Uh, he'll talk to our son about sports or whatever you know their mutual interests are. And if he isn't on his medicine, isn't taking the medicine regularly, he definitely gets a lot more subdued, more, not, doesn't speak as much. He's just very quiet and subdued. So you could tell if he's not taking his medicine regularly. Definitely. Any other thoughts on that? More energy, mm -hmm. more of a positive aspect even to their face. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more smiles. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem, I mean, I'm thinking of my brother now, but he has a really good sense of humor, but if he's down, that isn't showing at all. And uh, he also has Huntington's, and he's in a nursing home, and him having regular activities and having the antidepressant has just about wiped out depression mm -hmm. completely for him. I feel much better with my depressants too. I have a number of them. Um, I take, I kind of forget them all. <laughs> They're kind of combined with HD and depression, so I feel much better with my medications that I take myself. Do you, do you remember, do you feel like you got better very slowly from depression? Or was like it was, you know, one day you woke up and you thought, oh, I'm better now. Do you remember what that was like? Mm, I think it was more slow, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. especially, you know, with the HD diagnosis and that kind of thing. Yeah, it was a real slow process uh -huh. of kind of improving my mood, but, you know, and I have... There's been additional medication I'm taking now that kind of adds to the depression too, like some of the twitching medication and stuff like that for HD also helps with depression too, so yeah. It's been a, a gradual improvement actually, yeah. but 
I do feel that the tax will helps a lot, actually. So, has that been your experience? As if there are even setbacks or ups and downs when someone's getting better from depression? Um, well, certainly there are ups and downs um, with just the disease in general. Um, fortunately, my husband's been pretty stabilized. I mean, he does have his days where I come home and he, he's really very quiet. And, but when I get home and I can sit him down to a meal, especially, you know, because our son lives with us now, and it seems like sitting down, just simply doing that helps him a lot. Um, sometimes I just wonder, you know, if it's because he hasn't eaten very much during the day, because he doesn't eat very well during the day when I'm not there. And that's another struggle for me to get him to eat regularly while I'm at work. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you do definitely have your ups and downs, even when they're on consistent medication, I think. I think the eating regularly is another great point. So I always advise people about this with irritability. If you have somebody in the family who's, who's really moody and cranky, look at how often they're eating. Maybe they need to eat more often. We, as we know, people with HD need to have more calories than the rest of us, so eat more often. But it can go the same with mood. If your blood sugar starts to get too low, your mood is really going to drop. So if you're someone who's home by yourself, maybe have a friend knock on the door or someone call and remind you to have a snack so that you can kind of keep your blood sugar a little more consistent. And that may help you just to be a little bit more even during the day too, mm -hmm. right? That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of little meals seem to do better than three great big ones for the mood mm -hmm. in the you know, mm -hmm. people in my family, even me. I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> so one question I get a lot is, what's the difference between being depressed versus being discouraged by having this disease that affects so many different things? How do you know the difference? What's your, what's your thought on that? That's a tough one. A tough right? one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's it why is. I'm asking you guys. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I think it gets all mixed up together, actually. Or, you know, people get discouraged because they can't go fishing or like my son he was a huge uh, mountain bike rider and he used to take photography and he has sold his bikes and his photography equipment and but yet I don't see the depression in him but it's there is a sadness so you know it's it's a mixture I think mm -hmm. So the kind of losses I was describing of, of right. things that he likes to do, but yet he doesn't seem to get depressed. He keeps going. He might be, he gets discouraged. There's some anger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not necessarily at me or my husband, but you know, just at the situation in general. And I have not seen the depression in my son like I have in my husband, so that's fortunate. Mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing to me how two people in the same family can be completely different with Huntington's disease. They're not the same at all. That is one of the remarkable things, that you'll see people from the same family and one will have very bad depression and suicide attempts and another may not have much at all as far as behavior or may have more apathy and you know, it's right. really such a difference. Any other comments? I know we have some audience questions, but any other comments? difference between depression and discouragement about the disease? Well, I know that looking at the big picture makes everything really awful. And uh, projecting into the future, ridiculous. Ridiculous to even think about it, like the man said this morning. It's a waste of your time and energy. but. It is, um, I found cognitive behavioral therapy helps. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself just feeling terribly depressed or discouraged, mm -hmm. thinking about where that came from, is it an emotion that I'm reacting, you know, that I'm reacting mm -hmm. to a certain thought that I'm having, or is it an emotion that just washed over me and that is yeah. depression? But the, the thought, leading to the depression, that to me is discouragement. Mm -hmm. And um, 
also trying to take it all on yourself or all at once or look at all, you know, catastrophizing your life, that really, you know, just doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's just more practical to try to move your thought into a positive direction. But it took a long time for that. I mean, it took me 10 years mm -hmm. to get to the point where I can actually say, okay, this feels kind of fun because it's a pity party, but on the other hand, it's not getting me anywhere. Right. So, and Carrie is a real good example to me because she keeps plugging away yes. no matter mm -hmm. what. Well, I am 60 now, which is incredibly <laughs> long lived for an HD person, so that makes me feel better. <laughs> 60 is better. <laughs> as far as cognitive behavioral therapy, I should mention at the end of my handout there are a couple of resource slides. So there is a website you can go to to learn more about cognitive behavioral therapy. You can learn more about mindfulness there. There's the HD Guide to Understanding Behavior from HDSA, which is a terrific resource for psychiatric symptoms, and also the website for our center at Georgetown if any of you have particular questions for me. So we have audience questions now. So why do we care about the difference between apathy and depression? So part of it, I'll, I'll talk for a second and then I'll let you chime in. For me, part of it is treatment. So if somebody has apathy, it's probably going to be harder to treat with a medication and I'm going to be more likely to push you know, structured activities, exercise, getting out to see if we can make a difference in that way. If somebody has more depression, maybe I'll do more of a combination of both. And then it's also educating the family that when someone has apathy, they're not being difficult, they're not trying to be stubborn, they just have a hard time with motivation and it's part of the HD. And I'll let you ladies comment also. Yeah, it's true from my perspective, like even just sort of getting out for a jaunt and that kind of thing in the car, you know, around the neighborhood or something, even grocery shopping with my husband kind of makes me feel better because I've kind of gotten out of the house and, you know, feel kind of more energetic because just doing a small thing like that kind of helps a lot, actually. Yes. So this is, this is a great example for someone who has apathy is enlisting resources to, to help combat the apathy. So the example that you gave is um, when your son uh, was canceling dental appointments because just didn't feel up to or motivated to going, getting to the point of maybe having an abscess or an infection or something that was getting critical. So enlisting the local crisis team to go to the house and help remind them to get up. So that's kind of a good example of someone who's pretty apathetic but if somebody in uniform shows up at the door, they're likely to actually get up, and, and then once they're up, they'll probably go to the appointment, right? Yeah, so that's a great strategy, yeah. Yes? Is the depression a uh, result physiologically from Huntington's, or is that just because of the losses? So the question is, is the depression part of the physiology, the brain changes in Huntington's, or is it due to the many losses that I discussed? And you know, I feel it's really both. I mean, the fact that rates of depression are so high in Huntington's to me says that it is part of the process. We know that some of the chemicals uh, in the brain involved in reward and pleasure and, and having a good mood are affected by Huntington's disease pathology as it progresses. So we know that that is part of the picture. But then, of course, the many losses that we discussed as far as driving and family and caring for kids and other activities that is a part of it too. So I think part of it's a reaction to things that the disease takes away, but part of it is the changes in the brain that go on during progression of the disease. Yeah.
think it's also, I guess when we talk about losses, we're also talking about the loss of continents, the loss of ability to perform the things that you've done for years and all that. I remember my dad having an incident where, you know, it ended up being like the bathroom was an art exhibit. And, uh, and he just sort of sat there and said, this is such a mean disease. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. thought, that is the truth. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it takes everything that is important to you seemingly, except the love of your family, really. I mean, all the things that he did with my mother, like the coffee club and the gourmet club and the book club, mm -hmm. my dad was no longer a vital part of that and he had been and that was a hard thing and he mourned over that and the loss of dignity is terrible for anybody mm -hmm. just awful and so uh, you know there's a lot of good reasons for depression that mm -hmm. are a result of the disease but I think I think there are many reasons for depression but that doesn't mean it can't be treated so the second Absolutely. part of that is if, if someone says, well, this is awful, I can't use the toilet by myself, I can't drive, I can't feed myself, and, and you say, well, of course you're depressed. I mean, this does, you know, I would be too. That doesn't mean you just leave it at that. There are great treatments for depression. I went through a few of them um, in terms of these strategies. You can use different psychotherapies, talk therapies, and then these different medications. So I don't think it's right to just assume that because somebody has a difficult disease and it's getting worse, of course you're depressed. We're going to leave it at that, right? The next step is let's treat let's, it and see what we can do. Let's do what we can, right. we can to alleviate it. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yes? So the question is, this is uh, from the perspective of long-term care, so patients who are later stage, um, what's my opinion on giving small doses of antidepressants um, before someone seems to be depressed if they seem to be declining quite a bit? Um, I mean, in general, I don't know that I would agree with that. I think there are always exceptions. There are always cases. Maybe if someone's had a history of struggling with depression and they're not on an antidepressant now, I may say, you know, this is a very tough period of time and maybe we want to, you know, nip this in the bud, as they say. On the other hand, I don't like adding medications onto more medications because usually these people are on lots of other medications for things. So I, I tend not to do that, although I think there are always some good exceptions. Um, particularly someone who's struggled with depression before, had history of suicide attempts or other behavioral problems. Or sometimes, you know, someone's on a small dose of an antidepressant and it's not for depression, it's for anxiety or it's for irritability. It's someone who's really, you know, they're really, it's clear that they're not depressed, uh, but they do get very angry when someone tries to help them with things and just to kind of take the edge off the irritability. So that might be another case where an antidepressant would be used. Yes? So the question is, has a couple parts. So one part is, um, what's the training in psychiatry in general? What should you expect when you go to see a psychiatrist? Well, most psychiatrists have some training in HD. 
Will they um, have access to a resource guide? Should you bring them a resource guide? I guess that's the first part. So let me start with that part first. Most psychiatrists do not get any training in HD. Um, I think the typical medical school experience is maybe there'll be one HD patient or family member who may come in for you know half an hour and talk a little bit about the perspective on the disease, usually about the genetic testing. That's usually what's, what's uh, included in the curriculum. Um, however, most, most good psychiatrists should be able to treat depression pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, it's a pretty straightforward thing that we do all the time. You might need to be aware of the other medications someone's on, if they're taking medication for movement or other um, HD indications, but, uh, but really treating depression should be, you know, pretty bread and butter for most psychiatrists. I think that um, the, the resource guide that you mentioned, so that's included on the resource section of my slide, the, the Clinician's Guide to Understanding Behavior from HDSA, it's a great resource. It's a little daunting if you drop the whole volume on your doctor's desk, but if you bring it in and say, look, here's the section on depression, it's two pages, could you look at this with me? Um, you know, as long as you focus them, I think that's a reasonable request. Um, there are groups that are working right now, including the Huntington Study Group, to make short, accessible videos for healthcare professionals on treating depression and treating other symptoms of HD. Those aren't all up online yet, but those are coming. So there are groups that are looking to provide some of the expert guidance that I think you're, uh, you're seeking. Um, the other part of the question was, you know, what about dosing antidepressants? So um, is, it, is it true that someone with HD might need a higher dose of an antidepressant because the brain is damaged, so you need more drug to get into the brain? So to me, it's kind of a twofold thing. I find that some people with brain diseases, including HD, are really sensitive to medication. And you actually need a much smaller dose, and if you try to go too quickly or too high, you can get a lot of side effects. But we do have some patients that do need higher doses of antidepressants. So it's really individualized. I think it's, it's hard to give a general statement across the board. Um, I mean, I do generally tend to start with smaller doses uh, and go a little more slowly if someone has a brain disease, but there are cases where I end up going to the higher end of uh, the dosing. I don't know if any of you have experience on this or comments on this. Yes. So what, what, do you do? what do you do if you've tried a bunch of antidepressants and you've been allergic to every single one? I mean, I think it's, it's helpful to keep trying and, you know, it's always, I don't know what, what dosing levels you've had, but, you know, one question is, have they tried very small doses, very gradually, maybe dosing every other day to get it introduced into the system without such a big shock to your system? Sometimes that's helpful. Um, so, you know, really, really thinking about ways to, to get the smallest starting dose possible alternating days, taking it at a different time of day, so some people do better taking it in the morning or in the afternoon or evening, depending on the type of antidepressant. So there are different strategies you can use, because as I said, these are great drugs, but they come with side effects. So um, you know, if you experience so many side effects up front, you may not even know if you were able to stay on it for a month, would you actually get better from depression or not, because all you have is side effects, right? Any other comments on side effects or? I kind of staggered on my medication when I first took it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, yeah, I kind of started at a lower dose, yeah. and they sort of stepped it up. I know it was years ago, but I do remember that that's how I started it was with a smaller dose, yeah. and then gradually increased. You know over a month or something to the full dose. So. Do you recall having side effects? Do you recall if the medicine made you feel woozy or funny or anything? <laughs> no, in terms of woozy, or f I remember I was kind of sick to my stomach. Sick to your stomach. So that's a, a common side effect is stomach side effects, particularly with the SSRI type antidepressants mm -hmm. um, like paroxetine, sertraline. People can feel just a little, little bit of nausea, maybe a little diarrhea, just a little funny for a few days. It usually goes away, right. but if you experience it up front and you think this is going to be your life going forward, it's not so much exactly. fun. Exactly. It's like yeah. I sort of thought that. I was like, yeah, oh my God. <laughs> so that's an important point that I didn't get to mention, that when you start a medicine, um, you know, ha talk, with your, talk with your doctor about what are the side effects, and if there are side effects, should I expect them to go away? So the example I did give was venlafaxine, the medicine where for the first week or so when someone starts it, they often do feel kind of tired. They'll describe it as, oh, I feel like I'm getting a head cold. I feel like I can't think. And then after a few days, that usually does go away. But if you were taking that medication and you thought this was going to be your life going on, nobody would want to stay on it. So 
finding out up front, you know, if I have a side effect like nausea, can I take some food with the medicine? Do yeah, I expect right. it to go away in a few yeah. days, or should I should I find a different medicine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any recommendations for someone who's in a deep depression and the doctor has prescribed medications that they don't want to eat or take them or sleep or yeah. just don't want to? So what if someone's in a very deep depression? They don't want to eat. They don't want to sleep. The doctor has prescribed medication, and the person doesn't want to take medication. I think maybe we're talking about going to the hospital then. I think maybe it's it's time to think about um, about really you know arranging to have them taken to the hospital. In extreme cases, we'll call 911 and have an ambulance take someone to the hospital because depression can get very serious. It can get to the point where someone's not eating or drinking at all, and it really threatens their their uh, life. Um, sometimes it's part of the depression that someone feels like they want to take their own life by not eating or drinking. So important to, uh, to think about getting them to a hospital. All right, I think we've come to the end of our time today. Thank you all for being such a great audience with so many questions. And thank you to our panelists. You are wonderful. Thank you.